Okay, I'm gonna make this quick because instead of a big fancy intro, we are going to do this f***ing disclaimer thing. This disclaimer is of course not necessary to the library of the untold community who enjoy finishing these videos to catch the twist endings, thus the entire drift of our collective learning process. As this channel grows, it has been brought to my attention that there are a fraction of viewers who catch small portions out of context, causing knee-jerk reactions and sometimes, although very rare, visceral emotional reactions like unpreparedly quitting their jobs or taking allegorous speculation as literal interpretations of reality. So in lieu of an intro, I would like to make it clear that if you have any kind of sensitivity to the subject of death and dying whatsoever, please click off of this video. I mean, you can watch Harry and the Hendersons completely free, for example, or you can catch Air Bud 16 with a deep fake that makes it look like the star pupper protagonist is played by Sandra Bullock. That being said, I would like to dedicate this episode to the memory of my grandfather Don, an explorer and treasure hunter who was the first to tell me about the legend of Atlantis. Now let's kick this bitch off with some wisdom from Ram Dass. We are all just walking each other home. These immortal words by spiritual teacher Ram Dass are like butter on warm bread to us for some reason. Especially when he follows up with the statement, death is like taking off a tight shoe. As one of the many kings of one-liners like this, this simple statement alleviates both our innate fear of being alone, as well as our fear of the greatest mystery that mankind has ever faced. The mystery that is inevitable to everyone watching this video except for Keith Richards. The idea of death is uncomfortable to our conscious mind, but for some weird reason, it inspires us subconsciously. Just like the fact that a person becomes more comfortable with death the closer they get to it, it is also a fact that the deeper that we get to know our unconscious mind, the more comfortable we are with death. And although it should be the last thing on our minds when walking the path of our own individual hero's journeys, it rides the coattails of our mind constantly, reminding us that everything here is temporary. In the East, the temporality of everything is a comforting idea, but in the West we have been programmed to find it deeply disturbing. After all, we are going to lose all of the cool stuff that we have acquired, and we are going to lose all of the laughter and love of our family and friends. But wait a second. That is certainly an assumption, isn't it? We see a body that is lifeless, and we assume that the driver of that vehicle is now completely disconnected from the living world. The more I look into books of death by ancient Tibetans, Buddhists, Taoists, early Christians, and even groundbreaking modern research like those by Rupert Sheldrake, the more I realize that this is not at all the case. In fact, it might be the opposite. What if I told told you that death was a good thing. One might assume that what I mean is that, like the yin and yang, we need death for life to exist, but that's not where I'm going with this. It is beginning to occur to me quite definitively that death might not only be an escape from the black cube, but so much more than we have been told to believe by materialistic science and modern religions. I am here to tell you today that not only is death not to be feared, but as strange as it sounds, something to look forward to. And once this subconscious fear of death is gone, life, ironically, becomes so much sweeter than we could imagine. We become able to do our life's work without any inhibitions, and the liberation that comes from that process is a bliss far beyond anything that we can imagine with our biologically limited minds. Buck Dharma was absolutely correct when he assured us confidently, saying, don't fear the reaper. The spirit is not individual. It seems to be born from the earth. It is one with the earth. We are the earth's mind in motion. All individual human souls are attached to the earth spirit, like a fruit that blooms from a tree. When the fruit ripens, it falls from the tree. When the fruit ripens and falls from the tree, death greets us. It is then that we are released from the mother Gaia and into the bardo to possibly 
be reborn. What happens then is the greatest mystery. But one thing is for sure, we move forward based on our mindset lumped sum at the time of death. And although it might be possible to move backwards, I suppose that it is only momentarily like a whirlpool in a current that gets caught in a swirl going backwards for a brief time against the flow of the river, but eventually finds its way to sea just by relaxing as water always does. We can see this illustrated symbolically in William Blake's painting, Jacob's Ladder. In a swirling spiral staircase, most souls are moving up to a tightening source toward the top. And although some of these souls need an extra hand in getting up the stairs, very few of them are actually walking backwards. But it's worth noting that the only ones walking backward are carrying books and scrolls that should obviously represent knowledge. Like the Buddha politely digressing from rejoining unity with God in order to descend back down to help teach the collective consciousness of humanity something of infinite importance. And if there is any question whether or not this epic painting is meant to represent death, well, there's a dead guy at the bottom there. And I am assuming that the dead guy is there to symbolize um, a dead guy. The only other angelic figure who seems to be walking backward down the staircase is carrying water on her head. This is obviously an ancient archetype for work that needs to be done. Also in the painting seems to be souls reuniting, as well as the top boasting a great sun. I obviously don't have to tell you what the great sun represents, considering our prior videos on alchemical symbology, but what you might not know is that most of the Dolores Cannon's hypnosis patients described God as a great central sun archetype. So let me ask you, what can possibly be easier than death? Some of the easiest things we can think of, making toast, sitting on the couch, or even just going to sleep, none of these things are even close to the ease and relaxation that comes with dying. It is quite literally the easiest and most natural thing we can do, and we do it every day, ironically fighting against it with every fiber of our ego. Uh, very often, a doctor from the East will come to do work here in the West and be utterly surprised as to how hard we fight against death. Because when a person is in death process in India, for example, they are given hospice and a place to enter death as gracefully as possible. Here in the West, we will do just about anything to get Nana shoved into her 97th birthday. Uh, what could be more selfish than that? She is ready to go, and our suffering is coming from attachment, and I thought that the Buddha made it clear that that was a no-no. In fact, uh, just recently in St. Louis as a construction worker, I saw a wonderfully painted cathedral that had been used for years as a safe place for the dying. I saw it get torn down and demolished, and uh, what was put in its footprint, you might ask? Well, uh, it turned into a cement parking garage for a hospital that was so busy saving lives that it had to be doubled in size and the parking had to be more accessible. I mean, just look at the torture that we will inflict on patients stricken with cancer. We pulse dangerous radiation into their flesh and cause them to decay in great pain, hoping to kill the cancer at the same time. And I wonder if many years from now, we might look back on our medical practices with regret the same way that we look back on the Inquisition conducted by powerful people who assumed that they were doing the right thing as well. Meanwhile, in the East, people with terminal conditions often line up at a particular river to be incinerated, then have their ashes scattered into the waters. While waiting in line to be incinerated, they are seen having casual conversations about what they had for breakfast and, and, and smiling. What do they know that we don't? Because acting this casual in the face of death cannot come from a system of 
belief. This must be something that they just know. When speaking to a person who has had a near-death experience or has been resuscitated from death, we find a staggering amount of similarities in their stories. Parallels that cannot be chance happening. Science, of course, jumps in to conclude that this is a random firing of neurons in the brain, but let's keep in mind that this is also the same thing that they say about hallucinogens like ayahuasca. And I shouldn't have to tell you about the extremely effective and proven supernatural powers of ayahuasca. Not to mention, when you dig a little bit deep into the scientific explanations of NDEs, we always find that the materialistic scientist has minced the results to fit their particular dogmatic narrative. The same way that scientists found sugar to be perfectly safe in the 90s, uh, with research that was funded by Coca-Cola. One of you guys actually left a comment on a video about having a near-death experience, causing me to reach out to Mr. Eric Wold about it. And uh, we spoke and he broke down his experience to me and I was compelled to, uh to add it uh, to my book. In his email, he said to me, I woke up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom. And as I entered, I lost absolute control and my body fell to the floor. I remember a rush of light that brought me to a place that is very hard to describe. One of the bigger things I remember was the warm, embracing light that absolutely consumed me. The light was a color I couldn't explain and it doesn't exist in this universe, but it was very bright. I remember the feeling I experienced was finally whole. I felt absolute complete, loved, warm, and like all my worries and pain were left behind. In life, I experienced a lot of heartache and pain, so there was always this empty spot in my heart that I could never fill. But the place I went to, it didn't matter. That hole was gone, and I felt like I was finally home. I remember a group of entities talking to me about how much is out there in the whole universe and how small we are. There were no faces I could remember or voices that I could say I recognized. However, the weird thing was, I felt like we were connected. After seeing the different amazing things they showed me, I remember thinking this was finally it and I no longer had to suffer, but they told me I was not done yet and it wasn't my time. I came back to my body and the whole experience put me in a very deep and hard depression. It was like home and peace was ripped from me. I wanted it back so very badly. For a long time, I was scared to talk to anyone because of what others might think. But I finally decided to talk to my mother about it considering she was an RN. I felt like her advice would be helpful and maybe she could tell me if I was just losing my mind or not. She explained to me that my father experienced something similar that put him in a depression after coming back. Years later, after the experience, I met the love of my life and we overcame so many life-changing battles. Now we have a baby boy on the way. I now understand what they meant when they said I had more work to do and the experience has changed my life drastically on a spiritual level. I wish everyone could experience it, but I feel like not everyone is strong enough to pull themselves out of it, that being the regurgitation back into the black cube, I suppose. So I have no proof to show for it, but I can honestly say that I'm looking forward to the afterlife. And, uh, and Eric and I have kept in touch since he wrote this to me, and this experience has stayed with him, to say the least. While speaking with Eric, it became clear to me that he was not looking for attention by sharing the story, but was eager for other people to know about how beautiful it was. It also occurred to me that he was not aware of the multiple parallels that his story has with millions and millions of others, causing me to conclude that these kind of stories have to be looked for and sought out by us, despite how common they are. Why? Why do we hide this kind of beauty from each other? Viewers of this channel know damn well of my admiration of the ancient Vedic texts, including the Bhagavad Gita. So you guessed it, let's read some of my favorite quotes concerning death and life. Should be more smooth with these transitions, probably. Yeah, I'll edit the 
awkwardness out. The soul is never born and it never dies. The soul is not something that exists at one time and then vanishes the next. The soul is not something that does not exist at one time and then took birth and came into being subsequently. It is unchanging, eternal, and primeval. It is not destroyed when the body is destroyed. Another quote here. Weapons cannot cleave the soul. Fire cannot burn it. Water does not wet or drown. It does not do wind dry it. So obviously the translation there gets a little bit caught up in uh, synatics there. By the way, on that last quote, don't fill the comments up with is water wet philosophy it's, it, we're, that argument is all just arguing over mouth noises just as a human casts off worn out clothing puts on a new the soul too casts off old bodies and enters into new ones Gita 222. Just as the soul dwelling in the body passes through childhood, youth, and old age, in a similar manner, it travels from one body to another. Therefore, the wise do not get deluded over these changes. Gita 213. Last one here. When the soul enters a body, it becomes the master of that body. And when it leaves the body at death, it takes the mind and senses along with it. Just as the wind takes fragrances from their sources, being the flowers in this case, in this, in this example. Uh, Gita 15.8. You are the driver and the mechanic of the most important vehicle that this universe has yet to create. You are on the leading edge of sentient matter, an ever fluxing motion. To squander this gift is to be like a bird that can sing but won't. While we are alive in this body, we have the highest demand and opportunity to learn what conscious form does and acts like in physical reality. We will then take what we have learned and add it to the cosmic library, often referred to as the Akashic Records. What the purpose of this library is, we can only speculate. But if you look into death and the self with a capital S deeply enough, though, you will see that the answer is there waiting for you and in some strange way, depending on you. You can quote me on this when I say, die first, then quit then restart again with pride to be part of this ever mysterious process. Your purpose is far greater than paying bills and tracking your credit score. You can feel this in your bones, in your heart, in your soul. You may break the toxic cycles of your generation and pass that torch to the next generation to further expand the developing process of this game in an upward and forward direction. A game that has no obvious end game, but to continue evolving. You are both the teacher and the student in this paradox, where the student teaches the teacher. We learn from our children more than they learn from us, as they are, in fact, the next step in this eternal process. So, is it possible that raw sentience, despite being infinite, can grow and expand itself? Or is the process of growth, hence the ability to change, restricted to the realms outside of a first sentient source? In other words, if Earth is a classroom meant to further develop our souls, is it possible that it also goes the other way? Is there a way for beings inhabiting higher realms to grow themselves through the usage of our lower realms? Well, the book of Job has a very confusing plot. It seems to indicate that God is capable of torturing a righteous man while rubbing elbows with the devil in order to test this man's faith. And that external and literal interpretation of the scripture is one that turns many people away from these sacred texts. But uh, you are watching Library of the Untold right now, so let's find out if the story has a much deeper meaning. In his book, Answer to Job, Carl breaks down God's response to Job's prayer in a way that no person has yet to do so in our time. Jung wonders if this story is a metaphor for God or one's higher self to further develop its own sentience through the art of suffering. This would indicate that a primordial first cause was not fully conscious of right from wrong until going through this turmoil as Job. As Job. 
Jung seemed to indicate that he had to wrench himself free of God in a way in order to find the unity within himself that God seeks through man. Uh, he's quoted as saying, one cannot avoid the shadow unless one remains neurotic. The shadow is the block which separates us most effectively from the divine voice. Now, the backlash that Grandpa Carl received from theologians was so heavy that before he died, he wrote a letter to some of his followers and critics uh, saying the following, I have failed in my foremost task to open people's eyes to the fact that man has a soul and there is a buried treasure in the field and that our religion and philosophy are in a lamentable state. Mm. The concept pervades here that great suffering in life is the one and only key to true wisdom and actualization of the higher self. Suffering that is embraced and controlled leads to a bliss and understanding. Darkness leads to light death leads to life. When death enters, there will be no one left to grieve. And this is a final truth with no riddles attached. In the Tibetan Book of the Dead, rites of passage are spoken to the dying to guide him through the passageways of the bardo and warn of any obstacles that might lead us back into the cycle of samsara. The idea here is to transcend to the next stage of development. Definitely worth a side note is that these passages are spoken to the dead. We are just now learning in science today that the inner ear canal is the first organ to develop in the fetus and it is the last organ to die giving us a, a possible entire another video on cymatics and the importance of sound concerning the uh you know the connection of the more subtle higher realms the lower gross realms of the physical down in this bitch that we uh that we have here today in the egyptian book of the dead there is a notion of weighing the heart against a feather if your heart is lighter than a feather at ease you are to transcend onto the next stage of development but if your heart should be heavier, there is a different fate to follow, one that will involve more learning. So both of these so-called books of the dead and, and many others are interestingly similar in their notions of being able to break free from burden and to be born into a different kind of reality altogether. But they are realities where all of the paradoxes and riddles of life have been solved. But to gain access, we must be comfortable with our fate and at ease with how we have conducted ourselves in this life. To be able to have the opportunity to experience this kind of greatest of all truths firsthand. That is uh, absolute freedom. If you practice righteousness, you have nothing to worry about. If you are true, you have nothing to do. And waiting there is safety in the art of letting go. So ironically, it seems as though death is not the greatest mystery after all. Life is.
is all I see, blind by the sun.